I don't know if you guys do this, but I keep this list of imaginary titles that I think would sound cool on short stories or novels. And one of those titles is The Banyan Tree. I don't know, for me, just the idea of a banyan tree, it just sounds like it would make a good story. And I was at Half Price a couple months ago, browsing the dollar shelves, and I came across this book. Somebody had used that title, and I was interested in this book just because of that fact. I wanted to see what they did with this uh, with this title. And browsing through, it seemed like the kind of book that would be worthwhile, the kind of book that I like to read, which is very dense, poetic, uh, very strong with the rhythms, a lot of alliteration. He kind of repurposes nouns into verbs and just kind of plays with the language. All the dead thatch of language is taken out and we're left with just real solid words butted up against each other all the way through it appears and I was also interested in seeing how he could tell a compelling story for so many pages. This is almost 400 pages long in this type of heightened language and still hold a, a reader's interest. Also the fact that this book appears to have been published by a large uh, house. Now it describes the 80 plus years of the life of Minnie O'Brien. Uh, it's a rich saga of rural Ireland in the 20th century. But what really got me was this blurb that they printed right here. His descriptive prowess reminds one of Joyce. I mean, that's almost like a dare. I, Joyce is one of my favorite writers, and I was like, anytime somebody's compared to Joyce, I have to pick up the book and check it out. Indeed, this book is a sprawling epic about the life of this single person, Minnie O'Brien. Starts out with her parents, and then she's born, she grows up, she gets married, she has children of her own. She becomes a widow. Her children grow, grow up and do their own stuff, and then she dies. Um, there's lots of books written like this. It's like a literary biopic. Um, I read one earlier in the year, The Vivisector by Patrick White. Uh, sort of the same idea with the main character in this book, except this takes place in Australia. And there's another book, Independent People by Haldor Laxness. Uh, very similar type of story focusing on a farmer and his way of life. That book takes place in Ireland, or I'm sorry, Iceland. But this is in Ireland. Um, it's not really my cup of tea reading this type of book, but I'll go ahead and finish it since I, I finish most of the books that I start. And a lot of times I read books just as a way of distracting myself from other things, you know. I just with screens all around, it's so easy to just kind of get your life sucked into them. Um, so I kind of force myself to read, you know, uh, like 25 pages a day at least. And I thought this book would be good for that purpose, you know, just sort of like a meditative type of tool. And when a book becomes something like that for me, I actually would prefer that the writer doesn't do too much with the story. It's kind of weird. I don't want the writer to jar me around too much. I'd rather just be lulled into this sort of calm, meditative state. And this writer did that, you know? I mean, the story was so slow moving, so predictable, so, um, I don't know, even keeled that it felt static. It felt like you weren't, there wasn't any forward momentum. And then when it would jump from one scene to another or one character to another, you just didn't really notice or have any interest because things just moved at such a slow pace. The language is good. Uh, it's probably what pulled me forward uh, is the redeeming thing about it. And there are some phrases that and sentences that are really um, memorable. And there's even one page here where it, it seems like it's straight out of Ulysses. I mean, he did a really good imitation of Joyce on one of the pages. Um, but I don't know, one of the problems with this book for me was uh, how much he lingered on the characters and how sentimental he was. You could tell he really loved these characters like they he wanted to just wrap them up and not let them loose and into some real danger um, but every everything every thought every uh, event it was just just surrounded with so much cushioning prose and I thought it was a, a bit excessive and that to me is sort of the mark of an amateur writer although I can't that was what was conflicting about this because he, in some areas, writes like a master. The thing, though, that I can't help but factor in on the reading of this book was this tidbit right here. This author uh, 
It says he was deprived of oxygen for two hours of birth. He's mute and paralyzed. He writes by having someone hold his head while he taps at a typewriter with a stick attached to his forehead. So he tapped this book out in that way. He can't speak. Um, that's the only way he can express himself. And reading up more on this writer, it seemed like he was pretty much regarded as remedial um, throughout his childhood. His family tried to keep him um, keep his mind stimulated so his dad would read him Joyce and Beckett and D.H. Lawrence and finally he took some medicine that allowed him to have a little bit of movement in his neck so he was able to do that uh, method of composition and you know suddenly he was able to express himself and he was he was writing poems and short stories and he published a memoir and then he put out this book and this book took like 10 years for him to to tap out. I mean, he must have had a, a menuensis, but to compose in that way without being able to speak, um, it's a very constrained way of composition. And you, you have to wonder that, well, you have to factor in how much pain, physical pain, he went through to uh, type out all of this stuff, not to mention later on editing it or maybe I don't know, maybe there's a lack of editing going on here, which I think this book would have benefited from, but uh, but how can you edit someone like this? Um, I don't know, that phenomenon, just, just that really overshadowed some of the reading of this work, and I don't think he wants anyone to really know that um, or factor that in or take pity on him. He doesn't include any characters that suffer in the way that he must have suffered in his own life. There's no... Uh, there's no crippled characters. There's not a lot of characters that are pessimistic. A lot of these, well, I mean, except for the one antagonist who's the neighbor of this farmer who's trying to take up her land. But the family in general, this book is a very positive, optimistic, uplifting type of, of work. Even through this really physically constrained form, he was able to not only maintain his focus, I mean, his focus seemed to have been sharpened as a result, but the prose that resulted, just the length and depth, I mean, his level of vocabulary, uh, I mean, he still maintains this consistency throughout the story. There is that discipline there, but uh, he also allows himself to go on these flights of fancy when the, the poetic rhythms kind of carries him along and he's not afraid to do that. Um, all, this, all these sentences, he seems very alive behind these sentences, even though uh, it's a very slow-moving book. Um, there's really no dead spots, and you can feel that he's very present behind these words, that, that this writing was his way of living. And it makes you ponder about people with severe debilities, uh, what kind of inner lives that they have within. And he was fortunate to be able to find a, a means of uh, expressing it. Um, unfortunately, he passed away uh, age 43, so you wonder what would have happened if he had been able to continue writing. What would have resulted, you know, might have been, uh, I mean, the accomplishment here is is very immense and admirable, uh, totally beyond what I would have expected from a book uh, just at first glance. This book really had a lot behind it, it turns out. The Banyan Tree, Christopher Nolan.